So I'm super excited to talk to you guys about Google Analytics. It's my favorite subject. I get to work with it every day and uh, spend a lot of time in spreadsheets. Um, so it's a little bit about who I am. I work for Sakuri. I'm the digital marketing manager there. So I do a lot of stuff with Google Analytics, a lot of stuff with PPC and SEO. Um, and so I'm just going to share some of the stuff I've learned with you today. Um, Google Analytics is an awesome to get to know what's happening on your website, what visitors are doing, and to also identify some issues that you might want to uh, take some steps to resolve. So first, some definitions. Uh, my talk is called Google Analytics for Objective SEO and Diagnostics. So Google Analytics, if you're not already familiar with it, it's a free software that you can integrate with your website, go in and look at reports and see what's happening on your website. We'll take a look at a bunch of those. Um, objective, we're going to talk about that a little bit more and how it applies to SEO. And I'll also give some definitions of what SEO is, just in case you're new to it, um, and just how SEO works, just at a basic level. And then some diagnostic issues, the kinds of things that you can actually look at in Google Analytics. Um, how many people here are already using Google Analytics? A lot of people, cool. And how many of you guys are already using Google Analytics? More advanced, so like maybe uh, goals, cross-domain tracking, enhanced e-commerce. Okay, so a few of you, cool. So there's a lot you can do with that as well. Um, if you haven't gotten Google Analytics yet, you just have to go to google.com slash analytics. And then you can go ahead and sign up. The next screen that you'll see, it'll be asking you to set up your website. And there's three things uh, in Google Analytics, three levels. So there's your account. This belongs to you, to your Google account. So you could have multiple websites in your account, multiple clients. They're all separate. You have your account. And then properties. So that would be your website. And you would want to have one for um, you know, your main domain. Um, and then from there, you can have views for the subdomains of your website as well. And that would be uh, the views or one more thing uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. You can take a property like your website and then make as many views as you want to look at specific things. And I'll talk specifically about test views at some point, because you do want to create test views if you're going to be putting things like filters on your data, because that's going to change your data and uh, you don't want to mess with that. So views are awesome. I say use them as much as you can. You can delete them. Um, I think you can have up to 25 or 50 or something. Um, so once you enter in what you want for the name of your account, your own personal account, the name of your website or property, then the next screen that you'll get to here is your tracking code. So this UA code here is unique to your property, to your website. And that's what allows Google Analytics to send data from your website into the Google Analytics platform. You also have the tracking code here that you can just put into um, the head tag of, or into the body tag, sorry, of your web. And I'll show you how to do that in a sec here. So the easiest way, option one, is plugins. As usual with WordPress, everything is usually easier with plugins. And of course, being that I work for Securi, uh, we do website security. So I have to mention, you know, make sure that you choose your plugins wisely. So there's a couple bullet points there, um, some things that you can look at. Um, obviously, trusted sources. And WordPress.org repository gets code reviewed, so those are always really good. Trusted developers really is a good way to go as well. Um, I show uh, the Yoast one here. That's a really good option. Uh, we do work a lot with Yoast as well. Um, once you have the plugin installed, you just go into the plugin settings, and there's usually a place for you to just paste that little UA code. It makes it nice and easy, and then it does everything for you. Uh, if you want to do it manually, that's another option. You can actually just go into your appearance settings choose your theme. It should already have the default one selected that you're using. And then you go into the header.php file. And from there, you paste that little script there right after the body tag, the opening body tag. Plug in, you can just do it this way. It's a nice lightweight way of uh, implementing Google Analytics. <coughs> so let's talk a bit about objective and subjective. So when it comes to SEO, um, objectively, we want to look at things without any feelings or opinions. With SEO, we're talking about ranking stuff in search engines for certain keywords. So it is a little bit more subjective, and we'll talk about that in a second. SEO, if you're not familiar with it, is the process of ranking your content in Google. We all want to get to number one, and there's certain ways that you can do that. So you'll see there's the ads there on the side and on the top, but we're talking about the organic results, the ones that you don't have to pay Google to get into the search results. So how do search engines decide where your pages rank? This is what everybody wants to know. And if you're not familiar with SEO, I'm going to give you the really basic understanding. So for those of you who do SEO, just bear with me. We're going to go through the very basics here. First of all, you just want to make sure your pages are visible to Google. Googlebot crawls through the web, looking at different links, trying to find the new content can decide where to rank it. If you're blocking your Googlebot with a robots.txt file, or if you have 404 pages, Google doesn't see those, and they won't show up. We're not going to talk too much about that, but that's something that's important to keep. 
main two things that uh, really factor into SEO are keywords. So on your page, what are the words that are in there? Do they match what the searchers are looking for? And the other one is links. This is a really broad way of thinking about it. Who is linking to your page? Are you getting lots of links from authoritative sources? Are you getting links from social media? All these kinds of things are a way of showing the authority of your page and whether or not it's good content. So objective SEO is actually pretty subjective because really it depends on who you ask. All different search engines and each of them have their own algorithms. And uh, those algorithms are actually top secret. So they're not totally top secret, but they do keep you know, the actual alg algorithm so that people can't really hack into it and uh, you know, find a way to rank their stuff. And there are ways that um, people do SEO negatively. They'll buy links or you know, they'll stuff keywords on the page to try and rank it higher. And so Google does um, do algorithm changes. In fact, last year alone, there were over 400 changes to the Google algorithm. So it's changing a lot. And they do tell a little bit about some of them. So those of you who are involved in SEO probably have heard about Panda and Penguin. Those ones being white and black animals, they separate the white hat and black hat practices. So if you're buying links, if you're using spam to kind of increase your page rank, they're going to penalize you. And there's nothing worse than getting Google slapped. If you're engaging in bad SEO practices, it can really hurt you if Google finds out about it. Um, mobile Geddon happened in the spring uh, when Google decided that websites that have a good mobile user experience are, should be ranked higher because more and more people are using their devices to access websites. Hummingbird was a really interesting one um, last year or the year before that started to look at synonyms. It actually changed the whole algorithm in terms of how they rank things. So, for example, the word PC and computer are the same thing. That's a really basic example, but they go even more in depth. You might notice when you search something in Google that the bolded words in the search results aren't exactly what you typed, but they're close. Um, so that was Hummingbird. And then, of course, there's the social, local, and mobile contexts. If you search something while you're logged into Google, did any of your friends on Google Plus uh, plus one some link? That might show up higher just for you. Um, if you're searching locally and you're looking for restaurants, obviously it's going to show you restaurants in your city or wherever you are. Same thing with mobile. If you're searching for something, you might be wanting to find a phone number for a business. And search is always changing. There's always new things happening. Um, those are just a few examples of how the algorithm does change. So let's talk about Google SEO. If we're going to try and be objective, we have to think, what does Google want? So Google, first of all, wants at number one the best relevant ads. Google's business relies on people clicking on ads and paying for every click. Um, the next thing that they want is the best answers for the search query. Because the more that their search engine provides the best relevant answer to your search query, the more people that are going to continue to use Google. As soon as Google stops providing good answers, then people are going to go to Yahoo or going to go to Bing or something else. So Google tries to find what we all like to call quality content. I love that idea. Quality content's a great idea, but what is it? It's really hard to measure. It's a little bit subjective. So I like to think more about what Google does to identify bad results, because they can actually, and they do, look at this. So a term that is uh, really interesting is pogo sticking. Everyone's done this when they've been doing some research. You click on the first result, you look at it for five seconds. It's not what you want. You go look at number two. How long did you spend on that number one result? Uh, was the are there any 404 errors? Are there any uh, social interactions happening with that content? Are people sharing it? Do people find it valuable? Um, I mentioned the page. They can measure that. And they can also find out if people have skipped certain results because they don't think that they're going to match their query. And so there's things that are in Google Analytics that can show us if people are engaged with your content, if they're bouncing once they get to the page, and if they're uh, you know, actually staying on there a long time, reading the content, viewing more pages on your website, all that stuff you can find out in Google Analytics. For diagnostics, there's a bunch of different issues that we can find. I've mentioned before, and I'll show you that report in a second. Um, we can also see if there's bad referrers, spam people trying to link to your website or using your UA code, and I'll show you that too. Um, page load speeds, there's lots of information about the, the speed tons of different metrics. Um, once you actually do get into making custom reports, it's kind of how much you can do in terms of choosing the dimensions and metrics. Mobile devices, we can look at actually the devices, the operating systems, browsers, screen resolutions, stuff that's really important for web designers and web developers. So most people Google Analytics, this is what you're, where you'll get um, once you have your tracking code, this is what you'll see. And you can see at the top, we're on the reports tab. Most people live in the reports tab almost entirely in Google Analytics. That's not really where we're going to go. 
So we're about to dive into a bunch of different reports um, in the custom section. So uh, this is not the PM to probably dive into reports, but bear with me, they are really interesting once you actually get into them. So custom reports. You have all this data about your website in Google Analytics. The first thing you can do with custom reports is add a filter to say, I just want to see the stuff that's coming from organic search. I just want to see stuff affecting people on mobile devices or whatever you want. Just take this slice of data and then we'll make a report out of that. Once you do that, you can choose dimensions and metrics. The dimension is going to be the first column and it'll be one thing. So it might be your landing page. And then when you click on the landing page, you can have a secondary dimension that shows you, okay, for this one landing page, where are they coming from? Are they coming from a source that's, you know, social, is it organic, is it paid ads, is it email, whatever. There's tons of dimensions. You can choose from a bunch of them and you can just keep layering it down to keep drilling down into them. And the metrics are what make up the rest of the columns in the table and you can add pretty much as much as you want there. Um, and those are gonna be the numbers. So number of visitors, time on page, percentages, that kind of thing. So creating custom reports. Once you get into Google Analytics, you're gonna wanna go to the customization tab. And if you've never been here before, it's really awesome. Um, there's actually a couple different kinds of custom reports, but we're just gonna learn the basic ones today. But I definitely encourage you to play around with it and there's tons of resources as well. Customization, you just click new custom report. And then from there on the next screen, I'll show you what comes up. You're gonna add your metrics, dimensions, and your filters. So first we're gonna do a 404 error report here. So on the screen here, um, you're gonna see that you can add the name of your report and that kind of thing. But then the really important part here is the metrics. So the first thing we're going to look at is entrances. This is a dimension that is, or sorry, a metric that is the people who are coming in to that website. So it's going to say how many people have come into this page. Um, that was the first page they landed on. The dimensions that we want to look at are the landing page. So this is the actual URL that was used to access. And then from there, we're going to drill down into a secondary dimension, which is the refer. This is where they came from. So if the 404 came from a link on somebody's website, we're going to see that. Now the filter is what's really interesting here, and uh, we're gonna dive a little bit into regular expressions later, but this one's just basic. So the filter here is including a page title that has the regex not found. And the reason we're using regex here is because for our website here, we have blog.sakuri.net and www.sakuri.net. Both of them have a not found page. Um, the titles are actually different. They're not exactly the same, but both of them have the word not So this regular expression filter will catch both of those pages. So one do that, you can go ahead and save the report and this is what it's going to look like. So these are pages um, that people have tried to access and it shows me how many of them have 404'd. All of these people ended up on the 404 page and this is the link that they had typed in. Some of them here as you can see number nine has like a quote at the end so that was maybe a missed type one. Um, some of them aren't always going to be necessarily 404's, it might just be people, even sometimes hackers are trying to add different things to your website um, or to your URLs to hack you, you'll see those. It'll be like one visit though, or one entrance. But then what I can do here is uh, look into where are these um, 404's coming from. I mean if they're, because you actually are no longer have the page on your site, then what you're going to want to do is create a 301 redirect. And a 301 redirect basically tells Googlebot, this page is no longer here, it's actually over here. And it passes all of the SEO value to that new page. It's very important. There's nothing wrong with doing a 301 perfect way of preserving the SEO value of a page if you've moved it to another part of your site. But if it's not a missing page, um, and it's just somebody that has linked to you on their website but mistyped your URL, this is where you can drill down into that next dimension and you can click on one of the blue URLs there. And then this is actually the refer, the full refer of where um, those have come from. So if you, you know, for example, the wordpress.org plugin repository, we have access to that. We can go in and change that link. And that would be probably a better way to do it rather than 301 redirecting the wrong link. Um, pardon? Entrances, sorry, entrances are people actually entering on that page. So rather than um, sessions, it's kind of a little bit different. A session could be they came to that page at any point. It might be the third or fourth page that they visited on your site. This is actually where they entered your site. Um, or the metric associated with entrances is the number of entrances to the landing page that they, they came to your website on. So another report that we can do here that's awesome for SEO is to see which of your landing pages 
on your website are producing the most sessions, which ones are being viewed the most. And this gives you an idea of which content is performing the best. And we can also look at some things like bounce rate. The bounce rate would be um, people land on the page and then they leave your site after that. So um, it's a little bit different than exit rate. Um, bounce rate is the one you want to look at. It just means that after that page, they left your site. So ideally, you want people to be engaged in your site, to keep clicking, to go through your funnel or whatever you have you. Um, indication of the percentage of people who got to that page and then left your site completely after that. Time on page is another really important one as well. It kind of gives you an idea of how valuable that page is to people. It does depend too on how much content you have. If you're talking a long blog post and you're only there for a few minutes, that might not be so good. Um, but you know, higher time on page usually means that there's value on that page. And then for the dimensions, we just want the language. And then uh, we're going to drill down into the keyword to actually see what keywords brought them there. And because we're talking keywords, we want to actually filter only by the people who are coming in through organic search. So in this case, the filter is an include filter, including the channel, the default channel grouping is an exact match to organic search. And in the filter box down there, as you start typing, it'll actually come up with auto suggestions and you can just choose them from there. So that makes it a little easier. So um, when we look at this report, these are all people who have come from Google or some other search engine. And we can take a look at all the pages that have the most sessions. These are the ones that were viewed the most on your website. I mean, you can get up to 5,000 rows in Google, so you can keep going down, finding other content, and you can see if people are bouncing, see if they're spending a lot of time there. And from there, you can decide if you need to make optimizations um, or maybe drill in a little bit further to see what's happening in terms of any other diagnostic issues on that page. So when you drill down, um, I clicked on the XMLRPC blog post that we had. It was a brute force blog post. Clicked on it, and now it's showing me the keywords. So these are actually keywords that people have used to access this page. Um, probably see that 97% of them there are not provided. Ignore that for now. We will talk about that in a second. Super annoying. But we do at least have some keywords here that we can look at to get an idea of what people are searching for and what's bringing them to your top pages. And you can do this for any of your landing pages. It's a great report to, to drill down and find out for any of your content what's bringing people there. So we talked about mobile get-in. We might want to also look at the mobile landing pages and see are there people bouncing, are there time on page issues, page load, speed, that kind of thing. So for this one, it's almost the same. Um, the dimension drill downs are a little bit different. Here I'm going to look at the source uh, as well. So I might see if they're from social um, or if they're from email or whatever. A lot of people are using for those things. Um, and user type is a cool one too. This is new and returning users. So you can see if you know, there's a high percentage of new users, it means that people aren't coming back to that content on your mobile device. And then for the filter, we want to include the mobile input selector uh, touch screen. So this is going to be any device that has a touch screen. It's just going to show us the data for those people. So I can take a look here and I can see um, these are the pages that people are visiting the most from mobile. And you can see that uh, if you drill down into one of them, oh, hold on, <laughs> did I go up? Oh, anyway, you can look at like the, <laughs> I can't actually go back, I don't think, but, oh, there we go. Um, you can see here, like if there's a high bounce rate on any of them, you might want to look a little bit deeper. And that's actually the next report that I peeked at there um, to show you a little bit about what actual devices and operating systems are having issues um, from the mobile world. So for mobile performance, um, this kind of custom report, we're going to look again at those engagement metrics. And again, I use bounce rate and average time on page, but you can add whatever you want here, whatever is important to you for metrics. For the dimension drill downs, first we're going to look at operating system. And again, because we're filtering by the mobile input selector, this is just going to be mobile operating systems that we're going to see. And then from there, we can even drill down further into the device info so we can see if there's a particular device that's having an issue. Um, and some designers and developers might be interested in trying to find out how to tweak those if it's a large number of sessions. And I do always include sessions um, as one of the metrics just because it gives you kind of an indication of how many people are being affected. If you had like bounce rate for your first metric, then it's going to show like the 100% bounce rates as your first thing and that's what it's going to organize by. We kind of want to keep your reports organized by the most number of people who are going to be affected. So I like to use sessions or page views or anything like that to, uh, to first organize the report. And then from there, you drill down. So this report will show you, you know, we've got Android and iOS 
pretty decent, around 75%. That's not too bad. Time on page is okay, but if you look down at number seven, Symbian OS has a 90% bounce rate, and people are not spending a minute even on the page. So um, I'm actually not even sure what Symbian OS is personally, but it's only 191 people, so I don't know if it's worth you know design or development resources to fix that. But it's interesting when you drill down that a specific device on Android or iOS is having issues, and you can look to improve that in order to overall um, improve your bounce rate and your time on page. So we talked a little bit about keywords in Google Analytics. Those aren't actually there by default. In order to get keyword Google Analytics, you also have to sign up for Search Console. This is formerly Webmaster Tools, so if you do not have Webmaster Tools yet, if you haven't signed up, definitely highly recommend it. Um, for that, you just go to google.com slash webmasters. Again, you sign up with your Google account, and uh, it's going to ask you to add your property. This is the same thing. This is your website. You're going to want to add the HTTP and HTTPS versions if you have SSL. You're also going to want to add the www version and the bare domain because those will all be different. Um, and you're going to see different keyword data in each of them. So you know, for us at Sikari for a while, we had just the HTTP version. We do have SSL on our site. SSL version, tons more keywords came in. So that's the one that I ended up hooking up to our Google Analytics account. So you just have to verify ownership as well. Um, with Google Analytics, you added the tracking code. So that's a pretty great way of verifying ownership. You were able to add code to your website. Great. With Google uh, Search Console, there's a verify. But if you already have Google Analytics set up, you can actually use your Google account. Since you already have access to that property in Google Analytics, Search Console will let you verify that way. So it's a nice way to do it. And it just has a couple steps there you need to verify. Then you need to go back to Google Analytics, and you need to hook up your webmaster account, uh, sorry, your Search Console, with your Google Analytics property. If you have an account with multiple admins, if you make changes from your account, is it making changes to what everybody sees? Like, if you make custom reports and that, do they all get the custom reports? And... You have to share the URLs with them, yeah. OK. So, so yeah, you can. So if you add the webmaster tools, is that kind of thing? So the webmaster is an admin thing, and you can have one Webmaster Tools property associated with your pr one property in uh, Google Analytics. So okay. if you change that, it's changing that for everybody. Okay. Yeah, totally, okay. for sure. So yeah, you would do that in the admin section. Again, you'd only have access to that okay. if you're in the admin. Once you go into your property settings there, you're going to scroll to the bottom, and it's going to have a little button Webmaster Tools. And from there, you can hook it up. And then you'll start to get keyword data in Google Analytics, which will allow us to do a bunch of these other reports that I'm going to show you about. There's a couple other little things that you're going to need to do, just some prompts and that kind of stuff, pretty basic. But then once you do that, you're all set with keyword data. To anybody who have a mic, please raise your hand. I'll give you the mic because we're live streaming and they want you to For sure. Ask the For sure. Cool. So now that we have some keyword data, this is awesome. We actually have some objective data. This is what real people are searching for to get to your site. Again, we're looking at like 90% not provided. And we haven't heard those before. Um, Google not set, it's not really a bad one. It just means they didn't come from organic traffic. They didn't search anything. They came from email. They came from social. There was no keyword at all. So that one's not that bad. Um, but the not provided is the one that is really annoying for SEOs. This is because of encryption. Google is increasingly using HTTPS everywhere. And uh, it's just one of those things. It protects that data. So the user, it's not sending it to you at all. It's all scrambled. So there are still people who are using it without HTTPS, and those ones are where we're getting the keyword data from. And this is about it. This is about as much real data as you'll ever get for keywords. Um, you can do all kinds of keywords a day. This is what you're going to get for um, showing you the real keywords that people are using to get to your site. So let's make a report to show us just the keywords we want to see. So for this one, we're basically just going to exclude the keywords in the filter here. Again, I've got the same metric groups, those sessions, the bounce rate, whatever you want. Um, if you have enhanced e-commerce, you can do things like transactions. If you have goals, you can show the goal percentage completion. Um, whatever metrics are important to you. I just use some basic ones, but again, go, go crazy. You can add basically as many as you want. And when you go click the Add Metric button, it's going to have a drop-down menu, and it's going to overwhelm you with the awesome possibilities of all the metrics that you can do. Um, for dimension drill downs, we just want to look at keyword. And then we're going to drill down into landing page. So once we see the keywords, we'll be able to see which pages they went to. For the filter here, we're going to set exclude keyword and then exact not set in the brackets. And the same thing for not provided. And this is you know, just going to produce us a report that just doesn't have those 
provided keywords. So we don't see them. It's like they're not there. And last time I gave this talk, somebody asked me, well, can't you just ignore them? Yeah, you totally can. But actually, for this report that I took a screenshot of, there were a bunch of other keywords that I excluded. And you may find that there are keywords that you just don't want in your reports that keep coming up that are not useful to you. And then when you export this report or have it emailed to your boss, they're not going to be what's going on. This isn't you know, a huge number of keywords. Um, but there we go. So we can see here, um, this is the short amount of the report. Again, you can have up to 5,000 rows, so you can drill down and find out if there's a keyword that's maybe sending not so many people. Maybe those people are searching on the fourth page of Google to find you, and you can do some optimization keyword to move your ranking up. Um, yeah. Another really important diagnostic report is speed. Page speed plays a huge factor in SEO. Um, not really mostly because Google pays attention to it in their algorithm. That's debatable. But um, definitely for the user experience, people are going to bounce. Waiting page to load is sometimes a lot for people. And uh, it's just not a good user experience if they're waiting. They're going to go to some other site that's faster. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to look at sessions first to organize the report by the number of people who are affected. And then we're going to look at the server response time and page load time. So these are two different um, speed metrics. And there's actually a bunch more in Google Analytics that you choose from. I chose average server response time and page load time because the server response time is when you're first getting a response back to the client. They're like, aha, not a blank page. Something is loading. And then they start to think, OK, well, there's content coming. The page load time is how long it takes for the whole page to finish. And doesn't necessarily mean it's a terrible user experience, but it does maybe give us some indication of if that page needs to be optimized or um, if you need to you know, run it through the Google Page Speed tool to kind of see what is causing it to load so slowly for people. And again, because we're looking at um, just the uh, search people, we're going to actually create a filter just for the organic search. Um, for the drill downs too, I added country and user type because sometimes, you know, if you have your local business, you really don't care so much if a different country is loading it slowly. It might just be where your server is located or something like that. But you can drill down into whatever you want. So that report looks like this. Um, pages, and you can see, you know, the number of sessions here. At the top, we have our free site check. If you haven't seen it, it's just a tool you can do a malware scan of your website. It does take a while to load, um, especially if you're running a scan. So that's why we have a little bit of a higher speed there. I'm not too concerned about that. But if you noticed anything that was really, really low, you might want to look into why and run it through a page speed tool. Google has a bunch of free stuff. Um, we have a performance tool as well that I'll show you in a minute. And so you might be able to see if people is what you could add more metrics like bounce, whatever you wanted to see if it's actually affecting people and kind of make that correlation. So this is an, an interesting one I actually added for this presentation was user experience. If you're a developer or designer, you might be interested in which browsers or screen resolutions are having issues on your site. Um, if people aren't able to see your content very well, maybe they're going to go to another site or they're not going to spend much time looking at it because it's just not really working for their, um, their system. So for this one, I added bounce rate, time on page, server response time, load, and then I'm looking at the dimensions of the browser or screen resolution. Um, so I've got two different reports I'll show you. And then from their user type, again, whether people are new or returning. Um, so woo, there we go. So you can see here, um, and I didn't filter this by anything. So this is just all users coming to the site. Um, you know, We can see that there's a decent bounce rate for Chrome and for Firefox. But then for some of the other browsers, there might be some issues. Um, and then you can drill into that and see if you know there's any issues on a specific browser that you need to fix, and maybe you need to do some debugging or something. Um, same thing for the screen resolution. You know, an 800 by 600 screen resolution has a bit of a higher bounce rate um, and a little bit lower time on page compared to the rest of them. So maybe this website doesn't you know, respond so well to a smaller screen resolution. Um, might be something to look into if it was a significant amount of sessions. So I mentioned the load time tester a minute ago. If you want to test your website, we do the same kind of thing, time to first byte in a bunch of metrics. And we also test it at a bunch of servers around the world. So you can go ahead and just throw your website in there. This is a new tool that we've come out with. So you can definitely check it out. <clears throat> Host names are a really interesting one. So this is where we start to see bad people using your UA code. Remember I mentioned that UA code that's unique to your property. If it's just in your source code, they can just grab it and put it on their website. And now you're getting hits from somebody else's website coming into yours. So for this one, we're going to again look at the sessions. And then the dimension drill downs, we're going to choose our host name. 
in the country. So we're not going to actually filter it by anything, but what this is going to show us is all of the domains that are coming into your data. So we can see most of these are looking good. I've got SiteCheck, the blog, these are all Sakuri domains. Until we get down to the bottom here, we see fourwebmasters.org. That's not our website. I didn't put tracking code on that. Where's that coming from? Why is that in here? Somebody stole our tracking code and put it on their site, and now we're getting hits in there. And there's a lot of different reasons people are doing this. I wrote a blog post on blog.sakuri.net about ghost referral spam, so you can actually see the whole process in there. Um, and the one below it, the Google Translate one, that's not anything to worry about if you see that in your host names. That's just people viewing your website and need to translate it in order to read it. So what can we do about this uh, people using your UA code? It's not so good, right? If you use the Google Tag Manager, that's actually an awesome way to do it because it hides your UA code inside of a container. But if you're just using it the normal way, you're going to want to actually filter out these ghost referrals or these ghost host. So this is actually going to take us into the admin section of uh, the Google Analytics. And from here, we're going to do a filter. But instead of creating a filter on just a report, we're going to filter your whole view. So I mentioned views before. You have your property, your website, and you can add as many views as you want. You can have a view for every subdomain. You can have a view for test purposes. And I highly recommend you create a test view if you're going to do this, because once you add a filter to your property, all of the data that comes in after that is now filtered. You will never be able to go back and remove that filter from the new data coming in. So from there, you click Add New Filter. And then you're going to create a new filter, valid host names. We want to create a custom filter, and it's going to be an include filter. So this is telling Google Analytics only include the host names that I actually want, my websites. So if you have multiple subdomains, um, you need to actually use regular expressions. If you just have one website, www.whatever, that's great. You can just put that in as your filter pattern. If you have multiple ones, then you're actually going to need to um, include the regular expression here where we got that little hat, the carrot, your whole uh, domain, so www.sakuri.net, and then the dollar sign, and then we've got the, I uh, can't remember what that divider line is called, but, uh, and then you can add the other one. So for, for ours, we have a ton of these in a row, blog.sakuri.net, all of them. I've tested a bunch of different ways to use regular expressions, and this is the best one that I've found that works for this kind of filter. Um, so this just makes sure that basically what the regular expression is saying is start here, here's the domain, and end it with the, um, the dollar. So, and then add another one here. And this will just make sure that anything coming into your view comes from the websites you want. You'll never see ghosts in your uh, Google Analytics again. But then we've got another problem. Now you've got all this old data with four webmasters.org in it or whatever other ghosts. And I've seen some people who, you know, if you don't have a lot of traffic, Sometimes these ghost referrals can make up a significant amount of your traffic, and you're going to want to go back and look at your old data without that in it. So this is a different thing. We're going to make a segment. So to do this, we're going to go actually to the reporting tab, and in any report in Google Analytics at the top, you're going to see a place where you can add a segment. Um, so usually you'll see all sessions, a little place there that people ignore. You're going to click there to add a segment, create a new segment, and then it's going to have a little kind of report thing here. And you can go into the advanced conditions in the bottom there and click uh, sessions, include, host name, and then you want to do contains your website. So expressions here, we actually have an and button, so you can just add as many of your subdomains as you need. And you can go into your old reports um, and add that segment, and it'll just show you the traffic that only has the valid host names in it. So that's a nice way to make sure that you can go back and remove those ghosts. Another segment, since we're talking about SEO, is an organic search segment. So you just want to make sure um, if you're going to be looking specifically to try and make improvements to your SEO in Google Analytics, you're going to want to make sure you're looking just at those people who are coming from organic search. So similarly to how we made the filter in the custom reports, this is going to create a segment that shows users. And segments are super powerful, especially if you're using um, an e-commerce or goals. You can see a segment of people who have just come from social or people who have just come and completed a goal. And you can look and analyze what those people are doing across any report in Google Analytics anytime. Um, so I definitely use the organic search looking around in the pre-built reports in Google Analytics. And that's a nice way to just take a look at just the organic search people. <coughs> so the tricky thing about all these uh, custom report segments and dashboards is you can actually download them. Um, so you can actually go in and find people who have created these and uploaded them. And they've created links to them. 
before you can share them with your, uh, with your colleagues, the ones that you create. But now you know how to use them and you can make them your own. And a lot of them you do have to go in and customize them to make sure that your website is in there instead of the one that was a placeholder or that the metrics and stuff that are applied to those custom reports are the ones that matter to you. Um, a lot of them have enhanced e-commerce. If you don't have it set up, you can just remove those so those reports mean more to you. Um, you can export reports. You can have them emailed to you automatically or to your stakeholders. Reports in Google Analytics are an awesome way to just keep track of things on a regular basis. And I highly recommend that you make sure that you track the metrics that are important to you over time so you can see what's actually working for you if you're able to make any impact on performance. Um, and you can do that for any of the metrics that are important to you. So that's it for my talk. Um, so. Thank you.